I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and this time my patrons have voted for me to talk about another sovereignty thing. This one called Macha. So I guess I'm going to start this video by making an awful lot of the academic community in Irish myth and a large chunk of the neo-pagan community absolutely furious with me. There's an academic insecurity surrounding Irish myth and legend. There's an idea that it needs to be brought in line with the epics of Greece and Rome, and that until we do that, it will never quite be as good. Now, this idea is obviously nonsense, but it is still quite prevalent. This has motivated a persistent desire to make Irish myth and legend more like Greco-Roman legends by incorporating some of their features. Now, this can sometimes be as extreme as including Aristotle in Irish stories, or having Irish heroes such as Cúchulainn go off and fight the creatures and monsters of Greek myth. There's a widely accepted idea about Irish myth that I believe is really just another aspect of this desire to make Irish myth more like those of Greece and Rome. And this is the idea of the triplicated goddess. It's generally accepted that Macha, along with Bive and Morrigan, is a part of a triplicated goddess. Now, a triplicated goddess being a goddess who is split into three figures who each embody an aspect of that goddess. This is common in Greek and Norse mythology, and examples can be seen in Hecate and the Norns. I do not think this was a genuine feature of Irish mythology. The evidence this idea is hinged on is pretty exclusively described as tenuous even by its strongest proponents, and most of the evidence that does exist doesn't really occur in the texts themselves. It's more based on the idea that because it happens in other cultures, it must be happening in Irish culture as well. Which to me sounds like a massive case of interpretive bias. So the idea doesn't really get referenced until the 11th century, and when it does, it's by Christian monks. These people would have been classically trained, and would have had, as a result of their training, their teaching, a strong bias towards Greco-Roman culture. Prior to the 11th century, the names Bive, Macha, and Morrigan weren't really mentioned together very often, and the names Bive and Macha were often replaced with other names such as Nemeth, Amand, or Bridget. This, to me, offers less of a suggestion of three individuals representing different aspects of one goddess than it does one individual having many different names. Or else that Bive and Morrigan were titles rather than names that were held by many, more than three, different people at different times. Macha, however, stands out from Bive and Morrigan. The name Macha has far less crossover with the other two names than they do with each other, and is usually localised entirely within the province of Ulster. So what I think we have here is two regional versions of the same figure. One localised mostly within Ulster, named Macha, and the other spread out throughout the rest of Ireland, known variously as either Bive or Morrigan. Now I'll eventually talk about Morrigan slash Bive in another video at some point, but Macha gets her own video because her stories are much more distinct. As I said, Macha was a figure associated mostly with Ulster. Most of her stories would have taken place in Ulster and have come from Ulster. Now, the main royal and sacred site of Ulster is Awen Macha. Now that name it's unlikely to be a coincidence whether or not Macha was named after the place or the place was named after Macha is difficult to tell. There are, of course, three distinct stories about how Awan Macha got its name. 
all of them relate to at least one of the five different versions of Maka that occur throughout Irish myth. And so, like the Kylock, we see a figure associated with an important, culturally important, part of the land, and through that we can infer a certain amount of sovereignty. But unlike the Kylock, Maka was not seen as a prolific ancestor or matriarchal figure. Instead, she was seen as something of a protector of the province of Ulster, though she could and would revoke that protection at any time. There's at least five different Makas mentioned in Irish myth. Whether we should consider these all five separate individuals or different names or interpretations of the same character is difficult to tell. I'll go into them now. The first was Macha, daughter of Partholan. Now Macha, this Macha, and Partholan herself were descendants of Noah. They settled in Ireland after the flood and were almost certainly a complete fabrication of the Christian monks who were trying to write down Ireland's history and were just an attempt to bring Ireland's history more in line with the Bible. The second was Macha, the wife of Nemed. Now, Nemed was the ruler of the second wave of people who settled in Ireland. And his wife, Macha, was the first of Nemed's people to die in Ireland. Now, her burial place gave County Armagh its name, Ard Vacha, which can mean either the High Plain or the high place of Macha. Now, Armagh is in Ulster, so it's there we see the strong associations between Macha and Ulster begin to develop. It's also with this version of Macha that we see the association with crows begin to creep in, an association she shares with Bive and Morrigan. Macha, the daughter of Edmus, is the third Macha, and where we begin to see the association with war creep in. She was mentioned in a 13th century text, along with Bive and Morrigan. This three of them were said to offer their protection and help to the two of the Danann in their fight against the Fomorians. And it was here that the suggestion of Macha, Bive and Morrigan as a triplicated goddess began to take shape. Now this Macha is supposed to have died at the hands of Balar of the Baleful Eye. The fourth was Macha Mong Ruin, which means Macha of the Red Hair. She was the daughter of the Dagda. She was said to have built Awan Macha while she was the ruler of Ulster. She became ruler by luring all three of the men who were next in line for the seat of power with promises of sexual favours, and then beating the living shit out of all three of them. And finally, we have Macha, the wife of Crin. Now, this Macha, in the earliest known versions of this story, was referred to as Morrigan. And she is also strongly associated with the naming of Awan Macha. Fado, Fado. How the men of Ulster were considered some of the mightiest, strongest, fiercest warriors in all of Ireland. Nobody wanted to fight the Ulster men in battle. However, they were laid under a strange curse. A curse that said whenever Ulster was in its hour of direst need, its men would be laid low for five days, unable to fight. This curse all began years before with a wealthy cattle herder named Crin. But Crin was very well to do. His cattle gave incredible beef and leather. They gave amazing milk, which could be used to make delicious cheese and butter. They were sought after throughout all of Ireland. And Crin had a wife. She looked after the house, she minded the children, made his meals, cleaned and mended his clothes. They were very happy together. 
until the day she died. Now, as hard as this may be to believe, this was a period of Irish history where the men of Ireland were completely and utterly useless around the house. They couldn't cook, clean or sew for themselves. They couldn't look after themselves at all. They were basically children. And so, without his wife to look after him, Crin's health began to go into decline. And as he became weak and sickly, so too did his cattle become weak and sickly, until nobody would buy them again. But one day, a beautiful, gorgeous woman rose up from a nearby lake, and she entered Crin's home, and she began cleaning the house and preparing a meal. And Crin was very confused at this. Delighted, but confused. Until she explained that her name was Macha, and that she was to be his new wife. Now Crin and Macha were very happy together. She made the most delicious, sumptuous meals you've ever seen or tasted in your life. She kept the house in immaculate condition. And when she mended Crin's clothes, they weren't just fixed when she was done. They were better than when they were new. And with Macha looking after him, Crin recovered his health very quickly. He was better able to take care of the farm, and soon his cattle surpassed what they had been before. Not only sought after in all of Ireland now, but in all of Britain as well. Macha eventually became pregnant, and one day Crin was called up to the gathering of the Ulster men by the King of Ulster himself. And so he was thinking, oh, I need to go to this, I definitely need to go to this, I'll be in trouble if I don't. But also, when they have this, they always have a cattle market, and that's a very good opportunity for me. I can go there, I can sell some cows, make some business contacts. Maybe I'll even sell to the King of Ulster himself. That would be great. And Macha, hearing him say all this to himself, she chimes in. I agree. I think this is an excellent opportunity. Of course, you have to go. But you can make use of it as well. But when you go, promise me one thing. Promise you will mention me to no one. Pretend I do not exist. Now this was a very confusing request to get from your wife when you're about to leave on a business trip for a few days on your own. But Crin, he agreed anyway. He went up to the gathering. He ended up doing very well for himself. He made very important business contacts, sold loads of cows, and he heard that at that very moment in the next field, the King of Ulster was holding a horse for to see if anyone in all of Ulster, in all of Ireland, had horses faster than his own. And he thought to himself, this is it. This is my opportunity to get the king's ear, sell him some cows. I'm going to head into that horse race, see what happens. So he goes into the next field. He can see the king's horses are like lightning, making mincemeat of the others. And Crin just casually comments. My wife can run faster than that. Silence. You know that cough, the teacher coughs when you're in trouble. <coughs> the King of Ulster coughed that cough. Your wife can run faster than my horses, is it? Ah, no, Your Highness, I didn't mean it. I shouldn't have said that. It was only joking. You have made a boast, and now your wife must answer for it. My men will bring her here, and she will race my horses. So the king's men went to the home of Macha and Crin. They dragged Macha to the racing field, flung her in the dirt at the king's feet. She looked up at him and she said, Please, don't make me lose your host. I'm pregnant. You can see that I'm pregnant. 
At least wait for the baby to come. It won't be long. I'll do it after. No. Your husband has made a boast, and now you must answer for it. You will race my horses this instant, or he will be put to death. So reluctantly, Maka agreed to race the king's horse. She was trying as hard as she could, running as fast as she could. But she was struggling way behind. She had the big pregnant belly on her. And sure, the horses, they had four legs each, and she only had the two. But finally, she put on a sudden burst of speed. She overtook both the horses, crossed the finish line, and everyone was cheering for her. Until she collapsed on the ground, screaming in agony. And gave birth to two Still. Which is why that place is now known as Awal Mach, which means the twins. And as she lay there in the mud with her dead twins on either side of her, she laid a curse upon the men of Ulster. One that said whenever Ulster was in its hour of direst need, its men would be laid low for five days with the pains of childbirth. And that is why the Ulster men were cursed for their king's cruelty. In this story, we can see Maka as providing plenty, as providing benefit of improving the lives of those she is around. Or at least we can at first. This is a common theme in sovereignty figures. A good ruler makes the land plentiful, bountiful. A good ruler brings wealth to the land itself, not just to themselves. And so you see a figure who comes in bringing bounty and wealth, even to just a small man like Crin. You can see that. You can see that just slight hint of sovereignty in there. Of course, as well, the other aspect of sovereignty we see is in the naming of Awan Macha. The, the, the naming of Awan Macha after Macha, after her twins. It's important to note that the King of Ulster in this story is Kohor Magnyasa, who was a prick. He was an absolute bastard. He was a terrible, terrible person. No one should ever like Cahor. But despite having cursed the men of Ulster in this story, Maka is also credited with gifting one of Ulster's greatest warriors with one of the greatest horses in the world. She gave Cuchulain a horse known as the Grey of Maka. And what's Particularly interesting there is that while the men of Ulster were suffering under Macha's curse, Cuchulain, who was not yet considered a man because he either could not or would not grow a beard, was left to defend Ulster. So in that you can see her punishing the men of Ulster but not leaving them unprotected, still making a contribution to their protection because of the story I just told and because of her gifting Cuchulain with the Grey of Macha, Macha is strongly associated with horses, which is something that does not really occur with either Vive or Marag. But of course the most important lesson we should be taking from this story is that we should all be treating women better, especially not making pregnant women race horses, that's just horrendous. And that if you make your wife a promise, fucking keep it. Thank you for watching this video on Maka, and thanks to Ashkarp and my other patrons whose names are scrolling across the screen as we speak. Without them, I would not be able to afford the new camera I used for this video, many of the new props that are 
surrounding me in the set, and quite a few other things that I do for the channel. Uh, thanks to all of my non-patrons as well, y you watching my videos, sharing them, liking them, that really, really helps in terms of spreading the videos around, it helps algorithmically to get them in front of new faces, so thank you for that. If you want to support the channel, you can join my Patreon and become a patron. All patrons, no matter how much you're pledging, get to vote on the subject matter of my Irish folklore videos. And if you pledge $2 and above, you can join the monthly storytelling live stream that I've been trying to do for the past two months. Now, if you want more storytelling, if you want more storytelling, especially from an Irish tradition, I suggest listening to the Leprechaun Museum podcast, on which I appear occasionally as I do work there, and the podcast Sounds from the Shadows, which is run by one of my co-workers at the museum, Emily Collins. Both excellent podcasts, excellent storytelling, and fairly good analysis on the stories themselves. So, yes, that's that's everything. That's everything that I need to say. So thank you all for, for supporting the channel. And please do remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies. <laughs>